We lived in a small town. We had 150 people, mostly relatives. You know, you wondered what happened to your older brother. Well, he was just taken away from home. He just sort of disappeared. <laughs> and he was our older brother, so we were younger, so he would always take us to the movies. And he always liked John Wayne movies with a lot of action. Not too much talk, just a lot of action. <laughs> well, uh, he was taken to the state school halfway across the state. Everybody referred to it as the uh, Iowa School for the Deaf and Dumb. And I remember once my brother was home and someone was talking about the Iowa School for the Deaf and Dumb. My brother said, I may be deaf, but I'm not dumb. I remember one time I was in a store with him, and this has always stuck with me. I was in a grocery store, and we we're doing some shopping, and, and a clerk came up to him and, and asked him, you know, could I help you? What are you looking for? My brother always kept a little uh, notepad in his breast pocket and a pencil. He said, Here, I'm deaf. Write it, write it down. She didn't look at him for a second. She then turned to me and said, what does he want? It's like he just disappeared. And I said, I, I don't know, don't ask me, ask him. Well, he's deaf. I said, well, write it down for him then. Ask him what he wants. I, I always remember that. It's like she just all of a sudden just treated him as less than human, that he wasn't worth even trying to communicate with. When he graduated, he was only given three options. He could be a shoe cobbler, a printer's assistant, or a baker. Well, he didn't want to be any of those things. They just said, well, okay, then we're going to make you a baker. So he had no options. No one asked him what he wanted to do or what his goals were. So he's at this bake shop. He always went to work. He went to work at some ungodly hour, like 2 a.m. or something like that. And so early in the morning, this guy kept coming in and he struck up a conversation with my brother Frank. Well, again, Frank said, here, I'm deaf, write it down. So they started that conversation back and forth. After several weeks of this, this man asked my brother, he said, well, how do you like being a baker? And my brother said, I hate it. <laughs> and this guy said, well, what do, you like? what, do you, what do you want to do? What would you like to do? He said, I like to work with machines, and that's what I'm good at. I'm good at working with machines and tools and things like that. And this guy said, well, that's my business. I own a business, and, and, and that's what we do. We, 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 we make jet engine nozzles for jet engines. And he said, how would, how would you like to come work for me at Delavan Manufacturing? A small machine shop that actually made jet engine nozzles for like GE and Pratt and & Whitney. So he turned him over to the foreman, Mr. Delavan said, see what he can do, see what you can put him to work on. Mr. Delavan, about a month or so later, came back to the shop, saw the foreman and said, how's Harkin working out? The foreman said, fantastic. He said, this guy's amazing. He puts out more parts per hour. He never makes a mistake. He cleans up his workspace. He never is late for work. And he's so accurate on everything he does. So they're watching him. And this was a, a very intricate drilling press that had to drill these little holes in these jet engine nozzles. And they had to be exactly precise. Mr. Delta said, so we watched him. And we finally figured it out. The line he was working on was very noisy. Bells ringing, things clanging, drill presses operating, people shouting. He said it didn't bother him a bit. He just went right on. He never took his attention off of these little dials and all these things he had to work. So Mr. Dillon said, gee, it just dawned on me. He said, I hired your brother out of the goodness of my heart. I liked him. I felt sorry for him. But then after we watched him, 
I went out and actively hired more deaf people because it was better for my bottom line. <laughs> he worked there for 23 years. He had retirement benefits, he had health benefits, he had good pay uh, because he was paid just like everybody else. That taught me a very valuable lesson. And that was that people with disabilities can do just about anything they set their minds to do and do it a lot better in many cases than persons without disabilities. But that's sort of what guided me into the ADA and guided me into working on things like this. It probably comes as no surprise to you that I got involved with helping to establish the National Captioning Institute and uh, closed captioning television programs. Senator Jennings Randolph and I were the first two, we delivered the first box, decoding box to President Carter in the White House that decoded the closed captions. But I got one of the first ones from my brother Frank. So we took it out to Iowa, set it up, and I got him one of the old John Wayne movies, which he'd seen years before. And now he could understand what all the dialogue was. But I just watched how this just opened up for him, all new understanding. If he'd had that when he was in high school uh, and earlier on, I have no doubt that he probably would have been a, an engineer or something like that. Life became limited for people with disabilities. I'm in Congress. About the time we were getting this closed captioning thing going, my sister called me up. I'll never forget it. Her oldest boy, Kelly, joined the Navy. And he was a deckhand. He was a launch operator. He went underneath one of the jets, an A-6. And the pilot inadvertently shouldn't have done it had run his engines up. He got sucked down the intake. Fortunately, he had a hard hat on, went in the engine, broke his neck, and he lived. But it, he initially, he was quadriplegic. Uh, he gets out of the hospital after all this therapy and stuff. Uh, I go out to visit him. His father was very handy widened the doors, put a ramp in, re rebuilt the bathroom. I never thought about all this. We want to go out to dinner. He can't go. Why? He can't get across the street with a wheelchair. He can't go anywhere. Wow. I went back to Washington. He enrolled at Colorado State in Fort Collins. Sometime after that, I get a call from him, from Kelly. He calls me on the phone. He says, Uncle Tom, I need some help. I'm at Colorado State. I've got the GI Bill. And there's a course I want to take. But it's on the second floor. And there's no elevator, so they won't let me take the course. <laughs> Wait a minute. This can't be right. So I make a few phone calls, I call out, I'm just a congressman. And yes, well, they can't, you know, this is where the classes are taught and we're, we feel sorry for your nephew, but uh, nothing we can do about it. I said, wait, this can't be right. <laughs> All along, my vision kept getting broader. First, it was focused on deafness and communication disorders. But then what happened to my nephew, then I got to thinking about physical, other mobility problems. What happens to people who can't move around? Wheelchairs, they can't go anywhere. Well, of course, that's one of the things we wrote into the ADA. You know? <laughs> Programs must be accessible. People with disabilities like racial and ethnic minorities, women, are entitled to obtain a job enter a restaurant or hotel, ride a bus, listen to and watch the TV, use the telephone, and use public services free from invidious discrimination. 
and free from policies that exclude them solely on the basis of their disability. Every American must be guaranteed genuine opportunities to live their lives to the maximum of their potential. So all this is starting to come together. And, and then I met Danny Piper. He had Down syndrome, but his folks fought very hard for him to be in school. When I took over the Disability Policy Subcommittee, I started having hearings on laying the groundwork for the ADA. I had Danny Piper come in and testify. First person with Down syndrome to ever testify before a committee in the Congress. Dan, have you had any jobs? Uh, yes, I worked at a job. I worked at Park Ridge High. Where else have you worked? I worked at Walmart, Hardee's, Adelos, all stuff. Yeah. When you're an adult and you're not going to school anymore, do you want to work? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. And where where would you like to work when you're an adult and and earn some money? Uh, let me see. I I earn some money by a video store. So now my vision is gosh, not only hearing and communications, not just mobility, but how about intellectual disabilities? Huh. Now my vision is getting broader and broader all the time. The Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination against persons with disabilities in areas of employment, public accommodations, transportation, communications, and public services. It is my expectation that this legislation will become the law of the land. And that's the bill that finally became law. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and this is finished. This is an immensely important day, a day that belongs to all of you. It's a beautiful day. We were all down on this lawn. The sun was shining. It was fantastic. Because the ADA was really the capstone, broad civil rights bill. Three weeks ago, we celebrated our nation's Independence Day. And today we're here to rejoice in and celebrate another Independence Day, one that is long overdue. And with today's signing of the landmark Americans for Disabilities Act, every man, woman, and child with a disability can now pass through once closed doors into a bright new era of equality, independence, and freedom. You know, the four goals of the ADA are full participation, equal opportunity, independent living, economic self-sufficiency. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. And these words have been our guide for more than two centuries as we've labored to form our more perfect union. And today's legislation brings us closer to that day when no Americans will ever again be deprived of their basic guarantee of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I had a good year in 1990. I got three bills passed. IDEA, which provided for IEPs, Individualized Education Programs, and another bill, <laughs> it's called the Television Decoder and Circuitry Act of 1990 that mandated that every television set sold in America that had a 13-inch screen or bigger had to have the decoding chip incorporated in the TV set. And then I got the ADA passed, so then Bush signs that, then he signs IDEA, then he signs the TV decoder <laughs> bill, it's sort of like one right after the other. <laughs> He said, was it Harkin, is there no end to you? <laughs> After we got the ADA passed, it was just, uh, the feeling was just euphoric. People always say, what's, what's been the best accomplishment of the ADA? And I think breaking down the attitudinal barriers that people have. No, we still aren't there. There's still, still a lot of prejudice. There's still a lot of, of, um, patronizing attitudes. We know what's best for people with disabilities, that kind of thing. I, I, there's still that. But a lot of attitudes have changed. And um, I give a lot of credit to what I call the ADA generation, young people who were born after the ADA became effect, effective and have grown up under, went to school. Uh, they're not taking a back seat. You know? 
<laughs> they're not going to be uh, uh, patted on the head and told to go away. Uh, uh, and they're they're just breaking new barriers and doing things that people just never thought possible before. Well, I'll tell the story. Emily Hillman, young woman on an IEP, lived in a small town in Iowa. She finished her schooling and was immediately shunted into a sheltered workshop, folding clothes for, I think, like a, a buck an hour or something like that. It's very subminimum rate. She told her mother one day that she didn't like what she was doing, but she wanted to do something else. And her mother, Tammy, said, well, Em, what would you like to do? And Em said, I want to be a barista. And Em had found out that there was a school in Minneapolis that taught you how to be a barista. So they went to Voc Rehab, talked to people at Voc Rehab. Yes, they would help out. And so they went to Minneapolis and took her there. And it was like three weeks school, something like that. Teach you how to use these machines to make espresso and all that kind of stuff. They go back to their hometown and with the help of VR, Voc Rehab, uh, they got a, some support and some help loan and they found an empty storefront in this town of about 5,000 people. They took that storefront and they made it into a coffee shop called M's Coffee Company. And they got a machine to make espresso and all that kind of stuff and they set up the coffee shop. So M Hellman, a young woman, developmental disabilities, with a great personality, a great attitude, and willing to work hard, she started this little coffee shop. That was in 2009. 11 years later, Ends Coffee Company, that coffee shop is one of the linchpins of that community. People come there not just for coffee, now she serves lunches, <laughs> sandwiches, ice cream, it has a meeting room in back. It's sort of become an internet cafe where people can come and bring their laptops and that kind of thing. I think she has something like four or five employees now. Imagine that. She's actually employing people. Um, it's been a great success story. So in 2014, my last year in the Senate, uh, when President Obama signed the new Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, again, my bill, my last bill I got through. I invited Emma and her mother and her sister to come in to Washington for the signing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody, please be seated. Thank you. Well, welcome to the White House, everybody. As we approach the 24th anniversary of the ADA, this bill takes new steps to support Americans with disabilities who want to live and work independently. If you're working hard, you should be able to get a job, that job should pay well, and you should be able to move forward, look after your family. Opportunity for all. I want to thank all the Democrats and Republicans here today for getting this bill done. This is a big piece of work. You can see it's a big bill. But I'm also inviting you back. Let's do this more often. It's so much fun. Let's pass more bills to help create more good jobs. So we had this big signing, he went into a back room, and he got to meet M. Hillman. And so she got a picture with President Obama. And that was 2014. And so she'd been running this coffee shop. And now she has pictures on the wall, not of her and Obama, but of M. and the Republican governor of Iowa the Republican Senator from Iowa, the Democratic Congressperson, Hillary Clinton stopped there during her campaign. If you're running for office statewide in Iowa, you gotta stop at M's Coffee Shop. <laughs> Here is someone who was told that all she could do was fold clothes for a buck fifty an hour and nothing else. As a coffee shop, uh, has her own coffee brand, 
and I always joke, is in competition with Starbucks. How many people would have said that's got to be impossible? So don't put limits on people just because they have a physical, a mental, a developmental disability. Don't put any limits. Now, the one thing I haven't told you is this, and this is always my clincher. I mentioned she was from a small town in Iowa. You know what the name of that town is? Independence, Iowa. Independence, Iowa. How many more Emily Hillmans are there out there? If just given the chance, some support, some help like we all need, and the the wherewithal to pursue their dreams. The little story goes like this. If you're driving down a country road and you see a turtle, got that image, a turtle sitting on a fence post, you can be sure of one thing. It didn't get there by itself. There's nothing wrong in America with being a success. There's nothing wrong with having more money and having a nicer home and a nicer car and, and sending your kids to good schools and having nice vacations and a great retirement. That is a big part of the American dream. But I believe that when you make it to the top, and you make it to the top, and you make it to the top, and I make it to the top, one of the primary responsibilities of our free government is to make sure we leave the ladder down for others to climb. 35 years ago, we looked around America and we saw millions of people that no matter how hard they tried, could never climb that ladder of success. No matter how hard they tried, could never do it. These were our fellow Americans, our brothers and sisters with disabilities. So what did government do? We built them a ramp. And we called it the Americans with Disabilities Act. We opened the doors of accessibility and accommodation and we said to people with disabilities, now go on, follow your dreams. And in the words of the Army motto, be all you can be. Don't accept society's um, definition of who you are or what you are or what you're capable of doing. Decide for yourself what you want to do and who you're going to be and what you're going to do. I-L-Y means I love you.